started. Excuse me, please. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Humanica Optum Life Sciences Conference. My name is Alan Kamer. I'm one of the co-founders of Humanica. It's a great pleasure that I'm able to introduce Phil Simon. Phil Simon is a uh, leading commentator, speaker, and prognosticator about data, technology, and innovation. Phil has appeared on CNBC, NBC, contributed to the New York Times, Forbes.com, as well as his own blog, PhilSimon.com. And Phil is also the author of five books, including Too Big to Ignore, The Business Case for Big Data. And we're very fortunate to have Phil here with us today, who's going to share with us some of his thoughts about big data and what the future holds in healthcare. And Phil is also currently writing a new book about data visualization that he'll be able to reference. And Phil is going to be available after his talk to answer any questions and sign copies of the book for you. So with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Phil Simon. Thank you, Alan. Hello, hello, hello. Can everyone hear me okay? Too loud, too soft? Give me the Goldilocks text. Just right. Just right. Okay. Uh, thank you, Alan, for the kind words. My, my name again is Phil Simon, and I've written a bunch of books and even won an award or two. And I'd say around, I don't know, 18 months ago, I started hearing more about this topic of big data. And I realized that it was a big deal, and it was, in fact, too big to ignore. And tonight, I'm going to try to distill as much of the book as I can into around 30 minutes and take maybe 15 minutes of questions. Uh, and as Alan said, I will be happily signing books and mingling to answer any questions you may have. So this is who I am. Bunch of books. Lost the audio. Murphy's Law. There we go. There's an interesting book called Super Crunchers by a guy named Ian Ares. And in the book, the author asks the question, why do pilots always listen to data, but doctors so often ignore it? And the short answer is that unlike pilots, doctors don't go down with their planes. So I've been very intrigued about people who ignore all sorts of data, big data, small data. Uh, there's no shortage of buzz around the term big data. I really strive in all of my books to write in a way that I'd consider to be jargon-free. Um, I'm proud of having written five books, and you won't find a use of the word synergy, and they're big books. So just what is big data anyway? There's so much hype around the subject. There are something like 30 definitions of the term, and it was important to me to get on the same page because I thought Winston Churchill said this, but I've Googled it a bunch of times and it turns out he hasn't. There's no way I could say something quite this witty. Success begins with a common definition of terms. I thought that it was Winston Churchill. I don't think it is, but I firmly believe that whether you're writing a book as I have about big data or about platforms, it was important to define sort of the core premise of your book. But because there are so many different definitions of big data, and not just from talking heads like me, but from Gartner, from McKinsey, from all these think tanks and software vendors. I thought that I could spend 100 pages finding the perfect definition, and ultimately it didn't really matter. I thought that the characteristics were much more important. I think it was Voltaire who said, the perfect is the enemy of good, and I like that. So what are some of the major characteristics of big data? Show of hands, has anyone ever heard of the three V's? Nobody, okay. Big data is often associated with the three V's, and a guy by the name of Douglas Laney from Gartner around seven or eight years ago coined these three V's. And they are variety, velocity, and volume. Let's talk about variety. By way of background, I used to implement ERP and CRM systems. I started writing books around five years ago and then doing public speaking after that. Most organizations focus, for the, my opinion, on the data internal to the enterprise, and that data tends to be very structured, right? Excel-friendly, database-friendly, relational, very neat. Data isn't like that these days. There are many sources of data. There are many types of data. 
A little bit later, we'll talk about the different structures of data, right? Whether everything fits today in a neat spreadsheet. The short answer is it doesn't. So data is coming at us with increasing variety. Next up, velocity. Data is streaming at us faster than ever. It is like a fire hose, and it's only exacerbating. If you think that the big data trend is abating, I would argue you're wrong. And finally, volume. There's just more data than ever. Researching the book, and by way of background, I'm a bit of a geek, I could not believe some of the terms I found. We all know about gigabytes, and maybe terabytes, maybe petabytes. But there are exabytes, and yottabytes, and zettabytes. In fact, just recently, whoever is responsible for the naming had to create new terms like broncobytes, which is, I think, a one with 27 zeros at the end. Long story short, we're talking about a tremendous amount of data, most of which is unstructured. Again, it doesn't fall neatly into a spreadsheet. It's not sortable. It's not orderly. It's not relational. By some estimates, around 80 to 85% of all data generated today is unstructured or semi-structured. We're talking about YouTube videos or blog posts or Facebook likes or photos on Pinterest or all these other sites. Most data today is unstructured. And I would argue most of it is external to the enterprise. Long gone are the days, I would argue, in which the only data of any value existed within a company's walls. Today, there's tremendous value in data from external sources, whether they're social media sites, whether they're open data sources. I would argue, as I do in the book, that there just isn't value in data within your company's walls. Increasingly, this data is being generated by machines, not necessarily people. Has anyone heard of the Internet of Things? Okay, a few heads nodding. General Electric, for instance, is investing billions of dollars in building the industrial internet. No longer will you only connect to the web through your smartphone or your tablet or your PC or your laptop. We're talking about refrigerators. There are even apps that, if you have a pool, let you control that pool. So I live in Las Vegas. If I'm at a casino one night, not that I gamble. I could set the temperature for my pool remotely, and when I come home 20 minutes later, it's there. We are increasingly connecting devices, not to mention things like smart grids and refrigerators. Billions of additional devices will be connected to the web, and these devices are generating a tremendous amount of data. Has anyone ever heard of the Nest thermostat? Okay, see some heads? It learns how you like your temperature and not just 75 degrees. How do you like it at night? How do you like it in the winter? Is it different than the summer? It's actively generating data. We're not just talking about people tweeting or posting YouTube videos. Machines are generating a tremendous amount of data. In the book, I argue that it's inherently unmanageable. For those of you who have backgrounds in enterprise systems, ERP, CRM, you know that it's incredibly important to maintain the integrity of a master list, master employees, master customers, master products. Having duplicate records is a bad thing, right? You can't stop me from tweeting the same thing 10 times, uploading the same YouTube video. It is inherently unmanageable, at least in the traditional sense. In addition, it doesn't play nice with structured query language or SQL relational databases like Oracle or IBM DB2 or Microsoft SQL Server. A little bit later tonight, I'm going to talk to you about some of the new tools that companies are using to find the signal in the noise. I've queried some pretty big tables in my day. I can guarantee you that I can't write a query, and I consider myself a reasonably smart guy, that looks at six billion YouTube videos in any meaningful way. So it requires new tools. Al and I were talking a little bit earlier, and Michael and I were are as well, that the era of big data does not obviate the need for small data. Think about Amazon for a second. Amazon does an exceptionally good job of managing its small data. By way of example, two years ago, I lived 20 miles from here, and I decided to move to Las Vegas. I wanted Amazon to send me stuff, so I updated my address. 
Amazon, for 300 million customers, knows exactly who its customers are. Tony Fisher, a friend of mine, wrote a book called The Data Asset. And in it, based on research, he determined that there were something like 80% of all companies that couldn't determine who their customers are in less than two weeks. So managing small data is still essential, and companies that don't do a particularly good job of managing small data aren't likely to be successful with big data. But if you take a look at a company like Amazon, Apple, Facebook, Google, they understand that if you do small data well, more likely you will do big data well. In fact, the two complement each other. This show of hands, is anyone here an Amazon customer? Okay, most hands are up. Has anyone ever received an email from Amazon? Customers who liked X were also likely to buy Y. All of that is coming from big data. Yes, they're looking at individual transactions, but they're also looking at your ratings. They're looking at your browsing history. They're looking at big data. It isn't just a matter of looking at what you buy by simple keyword. When I was researching the last book, The Age of the Platform, how Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google have redefined business, I was astounded to find out that companies like, I believe it was buy.com, would do simple keyword searches. For instance, if I searched for Breaking Bad, which is my favorite TV show, buy.com would recommend the bad news bears. Why? Because they have the word bad in common. Now, for those of you who've never heard of the show Breaking Bad, it's about a high school chemistry teacher who has terminal lung cancer, six months to live, a pregnant wife, and to provide for his family, decides to start manufacturing crystal meth. Other than the word bad, that doesn't have a great deal in common with a bunch of ragtag misfits playing baseball. And I loved the Brad News, Bad News Bears as a kid. So Amazon is an example of a company that does big data very well. If you like Mad Men, then in all likelihood, you will be more inclined to purchase DVDs of, say, Mad Men or Sopranos or The Wire, shows with morally ambiguous or complicated characters. So small data still matters. But there are tremendous possibilities with big data in all industries. And healthcare is one of the biggest in this country, right? What are we talking about? In a $20 trillion economy, GDP, what's healthcare? About $3 trillion? It's about one in six, one in seven dollars. The opportunities are enormous. I have yet to meet any learned person who thought that healthcare costs were reasonable. They're completely spiraling out of control. Forget the $3 trillion we spend each year. Six to seven percent annual increases, $200 billion a year. What's that, three times the rate of inflation? Tremendous opportunity. In addition, big data can reduce inefficiency and waste, not to mention fraud. I came to know of Humedica when I reached out to Alan back in, I want to say March. My PR firm, when I put out this book, got me on CNBC. And CNBC had me on for a three-minute segment on big data in healthcare. There was one requirement. I had to be extremely specific about a company that was able to quantify the benefits of big data. And I Googled. And I'm good at Google. I know about keywords. I know about negative keywords. I've been Googling since 1999. I was amazed at the paucity of big data case studies in healthcare. And there are reasons for that we can talk about later. But I came to know of Allen because Humedica was one of the few companies that was willing to put out there a specific example of how big data was able to move the needle. In the course of my research, I came across statistics like of the $3 trillion spent annually on, big, on healthcare in this country, Anywhere from 20 to 40% was waste. Have you been to a doctor's office lately? <laughs> it's not the most efficient place. Beyond waste, there's a tremendous amount of fraud. Maybe 18 months ago, I was watching 60 Minutes. There was a report on Medicare. And by some estimates, there were 60 to $250 billion a year wasted on just fraud because according to statute, Medicare has to pay out claims within 30 days. So with big data, looking at an individual claim, it may not shed light on anything particularly interesting. But what if you're looking at thousands of claims? What if the same doctor charges a little bit high every time? You can find the patterns. You can find the signal in the noise. 
The elephant in the room is probably innovation. With this information, you can do tremendous things. We are just scratching the surface. Jeffrey Moore wrote in his book, Crossing the Chasm, about the technology adoption life cycle. There are always early adopters and laggards and the majority. We are just getting started. We are barely in the first inning of big data. We can do so many things. It's really just getting started. Another benefit, potentially increased patient and customer satisfaction. I recently switched healthcare providers. I won't slam anybody, but I went from provider A to provider B. I wasn't happy about having to send five emails, make three phone calls, and send six tweets to get a simple question answered. Do I need to pay the invoice that you just sent me because I signed up for auto pay? With big data, or even small data, I think there's tremendous potential to move the needle. Does anyone doubt that through information, we can get people the right programs, the right drugs, the right policies at the right time? We can increase our segmentation. One size fits all really doesn't work. Let's go back to Amazon for a second. If Amazon sent out a blanket spam email, not only would I be very unlikely to click on any of the links, I would probably unsubscribe altogether. Clinically focused patient segmentation. How sick is the patient? Treated by a particular doctor at a particular time, at a particular part of the country? These are fundamental questions that many healthcare organizations, for whatever reason, cannot answer. But when they start to integrate some of the data sources that I'll talk about very shortly, those questions become much less daunting. This stuff is very cool. Has anyone ever heard of Nate Silver? He wrote for the New York Times up until very recently. He predicted correctly 50 out of 50 gubernatorial races in 2012. He wrote a best-selling book I highly recommend called The Signal and the Noise, why most predictions fail but most don't. Through big data, healthcare organizations will be able to do a better job in predicting who is likely to get a disease? Who is likely to benefit from a particular drug? The ability to predict, while I would argue will never be perfect, will be orders of magnitude better than it is today. In addition, pinpointing at-risk patients. I would love to get a call from a doctor telling me, we're not trying to be nosy, but based on the information we have about you, you need to come in for a checkup. I would rather know sooner than later. I don't mind when my credit card company calls me and tells me, we think there's a problem because you just charged $2,000 in Europe. Does anyone mind that call? I, I don't. Big data will also give us the ability to know why. It is very difficult, and I'm not a statistician, to determine cause and effect. Big data, I think, will get us much closer to that. Why things are happening. Why are patients switching from one medication to another? There have been significant advances in the last five years on a technology called NLP, or natural language processing. I met a few of you earlier, and it sounds like a lot of you have a great deal of experience in healthcare. Something like 85% of the information on a form when you go to the doctor on a medical record is unstructured. To be able to take that information and identify patterns will let us discover things that we absolutely could never have predicted. I mentioned before how I came to know of Humedica. And one of the case studies on the Humedica website stems from Cornerstone Health. And they are located in High Point, North Carolina. And by implementing Humedica Mindshare, the company was able to determine patients who were likely to have diabetes but hadn't been diagnosed. Think about it. If you can pinpoint those people and contact them sooner and get them on medications and monitor if they're taking them, doesn't everybody win? Aren't we spending less in total than we would have normally? 
doesn't the patient benefit? To me, it's completely obvious. A very high percentage of patients identified had their conditions improved significantly. And from the standpoint of the healthcare provider, a lot of people came in and paid for their appointments. So again, in my opinion, there is tremendous benefit to do more with less and innovate in the process. It's important to think about different sources of data. And many organizations do a passable job at handling clinical data, okay? But as many of you know, clinical data is really just one piece of the puzzle, right? There are other sources of information, valuable sources, like claims data. Okay? I would love to know what my health insurance company does with the claims data. It's funny, about a, two months after I moved to Las Vegas, I had a fairly bare bones healthcare plan and I went to the doctor and the doctor charged me what I thought was kind of a high rate. But it was an extra $100 and I said, you know what, if that's what it costs, that's what it costs. 14 months later, I get a letter, not an email, not a phone call. Yeah, we overcharged you. Okay, so I called the doctor's office and can you just send me a check? Yeah, that'll be 60 to 90 days. Hard to imagine a more inefficient process. What if you could link this information? What if you could tie to open data? Increasingly, there are more open data sets out there. Now, it's important to note that these data sets don't necessarily allow you to drill down. They don't contain individually identifiable information. Name, employee address, social security number. Not employee address, regular address. But open data sets from governments, from institutions like CDC, would, I would argue, complement what individual institutions know about their patients. Maybe it's just group information, but it's still relevant. We can pull that data in. And finally, and some people may laugh, but social data. Is most of the data on Twitter noise to me? Absolutely. But are there ways for me to segment that data so I can see only the people who are tweeting with the hashtag big data? or the hashtag too big to ignore, or at Phil Simon? Absolutely. So what if you knew that people went to the same conference and someone had food poisoning there? Again, most of it is arguably noise, but there is a signal in that noise. And the magic happens when you bring these data sources together. And in fact, when you combine them all, I would argue that one plus one can equal, equal a lot more than one. There is exponential opportunity and value in combining these data sources. Again, it's not necessarily that we'll have better answers, although I'll argue that that may happen. Big data al allows us to ask better questions. Now, how is all of this possible? Right? I mentioned before that relational databases and tables and structured query language, or SQL, have limitations. There are many different tools that allow organizations to make sense of this big data, one of which is R. And R is an open source statistical package. Now, you might have to massage the data to get it in a format that's R friendly, but it's an incredibly powerful tool. And because it's open source, and I write about this in my previous book, The Age of the Platform, there's an ecosystem. There are people saying, hmm, what if we did this? What if we took it in a different direction? The community is improving upon it. It's a lot like Wikipedia. Next up, show of hands. Anyone heard of Hadoop? Okay. Hadoop isn't a database per se, although it lets organization access tremendous amounts of data. It's a distributed file system. Organizations can take advantage of different clusters and nodes and all of these computers, and if one of them fails, data is just seamlessly moved to a different cluster or node. Hadoop is enormous, so much so that while researching this book, I could not believe that companies like SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, companies that haven't always been exactly friendly to open source software said, we realize this is a big deal. Rather than fight it, we are going to try to integrate with it. Hadoop is just one of a series of NoSQL databases. 
And by NoSQL, some people think it doesn't use SQL. In reality, it means not only SQL. But there are also things like new SQL. So the point is that you don't necessarily have to use old tools with big data. In fact, I would argue in the book that it's ill-advised. Companies like IBM are doing tremendous things with sentiment analysis. But we're not just talking about big companies here. I'm a really bad investor. I'm the guy who bought Apple at 675. <laughs> because people were telling me it was going to 1100 and I got tired of waiting. There are companies now like say Ravenpack that will look at tweets and look at blog posts and try to determine the sentiment around companies like Apple. Now, do you want to base your entire investment portfolio if you run a hedge fund on what people are tweeting? Probably not. But is that potentially valuable information? I would argue yes. There's, there have been tremendous advances in the field of text analytics or text mining. So once you take that information that's on the medical record, what are people saying? Right? How does it relate? Along these lines, one of the biggest technologies, and I could have written an entire book about this, it's called natural language processing. The figure here is from the visual thesaurus. And just for giggles, I put in the word confuse. Automatically, the visual thesaurus shows me the relationships between confuse and other synonyms. And there's absolutely no reason that the same thing can't be done for drugs, for symptoms or conditions. Show of hands, anyone here in sales or marketing? Okay, a few people. A-B or split testing is absolutely amazing. Companies like Amazon, Apple, Facebook do this all the time. And I'm not talking about necessarily big decisions. Marissa Meyer, who's now the CEO of Yahoo, while at Google would A-B test everything. How blue should the Google font be on the Google homepage? Where should they put the search bar? I'm not talking about upper right-hand corner. I'm talking about to the pixel. And by running very small tests, companies can essentially prove that something is better. Right? So if you're in sales and marketing, what kind of tactic will work with each person? In the 2012 presidential election, I would argue that one of the re main reasons that the Obama team did so well, and that President Obama ultimately won, was the use of big data. Doing A-B testing, figuring out which levers worked in which ways for which populations, realizing that one size does not fit all. Predictive analytics represents the holy grail. And it's important to note that it doesn't happen overnight. Right? But as you add different data sources, you get better at predicting. Not to mention things like meta-analyses. There have been, I would imagine, thousands of studies conducted on the efficacy of different drugs or all sorts of issues related to healthcare. Rather than have people read them and summarize them, there are tools now that will look at them and analyze the analyses. Lord knows what you can find. There's a tremendous amount of information out there, and I'm not a neurologist, but from the research I've been doing on the current book, the human brain comprehends information in a visual form anywhere from 60 to 100 times faster than looking at raw data. Data visualization is huge. Again, particularly if it's interactive, you can see what's going on. Right. And this, just as an example, is from the, is an example of open data from something called DocGraph. And it's a project that shows the U.S. health care system and how it delivers care. This shows how doctors, hospitals, laboratories, and other health care providers treat Medicare patients. And to the extent that it's interactive, you can see how things are changing in real time. Now, you may look at this and say, what do I do with it? And I can't necessarily tell you that well, then you need to do X, Y, and Z. The point is that we can visualize tremendous amounts of information that, again, may not necessarily give us the precise answer to our questions, but can allow us to ask better questions. 
big data and the solutions around it don't implement themselves, right? This isn't the terminator. People make decisions. And to that end, it's very important to be cognizant of some of these human considerations. I believe in the power of big data. That's one of the reasons I wrote the book. However, there are plenty of people who don't see it that way. Plenty of people are, quite frankly, data phobes. When I worked in the pharmaceutical industry, I once dealt with a human resource director who wanted me to analyze how the company was spending its money with regard to recruiting. The company was recruiting at Ivy League schools. I am not anti-Ivy League. I actually went to an Ivy League school. But if you're spending $300,000 a year to recruit at Harvard to get one person who leaves after six months, when in fact you're spending a fraction of that to go to the State University of New Jersey, Rutgers, and you're getting five to 10 year employees who are actually promoted a bunch of times, didn't make a whole lot of sense to keep recruiting at Ivy League schools. When I presented my findings to this director of HR, his answer was very simple. But I like going to Ivy League schools. <laughs> and that was small data. Big data makes very people uncomfortable. I have come across many people who say, ah, data. It's important to recognize that not everybody is on the big data train. It often meets with resistance and quite a bit of it. However, as I argue in the book, it is essential to the future of business. Big data is too big to ignore. It isn't going anywhere. Please tell me someone knows what this picture is. OK, thank you. I like my visuals. So what are some recommendations for getting started? Go for about another five minutes here, and then I'll take as many questions as you have. It's important to embrace data discovery. I have a real problem with this notion, and I write this in the book, of an ROI on big data. Can you calculate one? Sure. But it is incredibly subjective. Who knows what you're going to find? You may generate a ton of data and integrate it and start to analyze it. And for year one or year two, not really move the needle on anything. But you're laying the foundation. Companies don't go from zero to Google overnight. Google's 15 years old. They didn't wake up and start doing big data. They've been doing big data long before it was called big data. Think incrementally and add new types of data. It is very dangerous to grab untold petabytes of information and say, okay, what do we do with it? It's not a bad idea to start small. There's a term that I love from my first book, Why New Systems Fail, boiling the ocean. Very dangerous to do. It takes time. It's a cultural shift. Has anyone heard the term data science before? OK, a couple hands. It's not just another term for statistician. If you're dealing with petabytes of information, you don't capitalize that overnight. Why not start relatively small? Everyone wants to do predictions, but they're easier said than done. Many organizations can't even describe their current employee populations or their patient populations, or their customers. And that's very dangerous. We all want to get to prediction. In all likelihood, though, how can you predict what your customers are going to do, or your patients, if you don't know who they are? If people have wildly high expectations about something. Let's say, oh, we think the ROI on big data is going to be 200%, and it's only 120. They're disappointed. I find that it's best, and the companies I profile in the book said, well, let's throw something out there. Let's see if it works. One of my favorite anecdotes from the book is from the city of Boston. There's an app called Street Bump. And the mayor of Boston, I think he's still the mayor, Thomas Menino, is very progressive. He thinks that we all ought to be urban mechanics. And he created an app called Street Bump with his team. So you drive around Boston, and you download the app. Your cell phone's on. You don't have to do anything. But let's say you're driving, and you hit a bump. Now, if it's one person, maybe that person swerved. What if it's 10? What if it's 100? What if it's 10,000? There's probably something there. So it's important to manage expectations. If the initial goal was to solve all the traffic problems, it probably would have failed. But what if the goal was just to get a handle on things? Again, starting small is definitely a good idea. Building internal momentum. I'm a big believer that the carrot works better than the stick. 
if an organization's marketing or sales department is having success with big data, why not communicate that to other parts of the organization? Why not have people come to you and say, how did you guys do that? As opposed to, yeah, my boss is making me understand what you're doing. It's a different mindset. The carrot works better than the stick. Aiming for little victories and communicating them. Um, again, you don't go from zero to Google overnight. Ideally, you're having people come to you. In my very simple view of the world, and this goes all the way back to my first book, there are three types of people. Those that get it, present company hopefully included. Those that don't get it and want to get it, maybe some of you are out there. And then the people who don't get it and they never want to get it. Unlikely that they're going to be coming to you. When I think about standard reports, there's this mentality of setting it and forgetting it. I've written more, literally, thousands of reports for my clients going back to my consulting days. Big data is not about setting it and forget it. New data sources emerged. Two years ago, Pinterest didn't exist. Now it has a $2.5 billion valuation. Is there value in Pinterest? Sure. As an author, I absolutely have my stuff on Pinterest. It's important to look outside of the organization. Again, open data sources are increasingly important regardless of whether or not you're talking about individually identifiable information. And finally, to borrow from the Marines, lead, follower, get out of the way. I believe that there's tremendous opportunity in healthcare with regard to big data. There are plenty of skeptics. Obviously, I think the good outweighs the bad. In the book, I discuss, I believe it's chapter seven, issues regarding security and privacy. So I'm happy to take questions on those. But as Melvin Kranzberg once said, and it's one of my favorite quotes, I think I quote it in three of my five books, Technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. I would argue that it's about 90% positive. There, there's that 10%. But to me, because so few organizations in general, much less healthcare, have adopted anything remotely close to big data, in my opinion, the time to strike is now. Here is how you can connect with me. And I have time for as many questions as you like. Or none at all. <laughs> Does anyone who's know, who know who's winning the tennis match, by the way? I saw that Nadal was up 6-2. OK. But we can talk about big data, too. Yes? Sure. The question, for those of you who didn't hear it, was, are there any organizations using social data in healthcare? I can't cite a specific example, but I would say this much. With $3 trillion of our economy going to healthcare, I am fairly certain that at least one hospital, one insurance company, maybe even an independent physician, I mean, what's going on on Twitter? Um, are they quantifying it? Again, it was very difficult for me to find examples of companies using different types of data. That's why you know, Alan and I clicked so quickly. Oh, you have a specific answer for me. Um, again, very few organizations, I think, want to be on the bleeding edge. And, and for good reason, right? Am I a fan of big data? Absolutely. But it's important to differentiate among different industries. For instance, if you're Facebook and you roll out a new feature, and people don't like it, you can unroll it. No one's probably going to die, right? Facebook really doesn't face, in this context, things like, oh, I don't know, HIPAA. So I understand the conservatism of many organizations, but I can't tell you specifically. A lot of organizations keep their cards extremely close to the vest. And my hunch is that as more organizations start to do different things and have success with big data or social data, we will see more of it. But we really are just getting started with this. Um, my hunch is that a decent number is, but I can't tell you that, oh, sure, go to xyz.com and click on case study, and you'll find 25 examples of companies that have used Twitter to improve the healthcare experience. Do I think it's possible? Yes. Are a lot of organizations doing it? No. Many organizations are struggling to get their arms around big data because there's so much hype. Remember, we live in an era of social media. Everybody has a bullhorn. 
it is very difficult for people to justify doing these types of things because it requires new tools, right? Big data doesn't work with an Oracle database. Uh, many organizations want to kind of wait and see. So I'm sure that it's happening, but I can't tell you a specific example. Yes? Okay. We could talk for a very long time. The question was, how do we basically get IT on board? Because in many organizations, and I come from a background in healthcare to a large extent, IT was basically the gatekeeper, right? You needed IT's permission. Talk for a very long time about the IT business divide, and it's an unfortunate one because, in my opinion, the most progressive organizations, irrespective of industry, understand that the business generates the data, and the business, I would argue, should own the data. Now, there are all sorts of reasons that IT has traditionally been tasked with that. Uh, first and foremost, I'm old enough to remember when the tools for extracting and analyzing data weren't terribly user friendly, and most functional users didn't come with a degree in computer science. Um, the most progressive organizations, I would argue, understand that it's not IT's data. Hopefully it's some sort of partnership, and that's a bit of a cliche, but I have personally worked in hospitals extracting information and been in very animated discussions slash arguments with people, saying, how come IT screwed up this data? Guess what? The IT person wasn't entering a claim, wasn't entering a journal entry, wasn't entering an employee paycheck. I would argue that it starts with understanding that it's not IT's data, it's the business's data. Whether or not your organization uses the cloud is almost irrelevant. IT should not be viewed that way, in my opinion. It is in many companies, but there's a real danger in basically asking IT for permission. I've seen this happen more times than I can count. Hey, IT, I need a report that does X, Y, and Z, and they give you that report. But you asked for X, Y, and Z, and you really meant X, A, and B. So back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. It's not very efficient. The tools now have become so much more user friendly. I just saw a demo of one of the Humedica products last week. You don't need to be a computer scientist. So I would argue that if IT is the bottleneck, to use your term, then one of my questions is, do you have the right tools to unleash the power of that data? Any other questions? Yes. Oh, either one. Okay. Okay. SAS, SAS or SAAS? Okay. Mm. Mm. For those of you in here, um, the, the question slash comment was around only one company, Glasso uh, Smith Fine, using social data uh, with a particular vendor. It doesn't surprise me because I'm on Facebook and in Twitter, and I will share certain life events, but I'm not about to say I went to the podiatrist, much less anything more personal than that. So I think that if you're using social data, understand that it's not going to be a comprehensive repository of data. Because certain people will share certain things with certain people at certain times. And oh, by the way, let's not forget that Facebook keeps its data basically under a locked cage. Larry Page, the CEO of Google, was on Charlie Rose about a year ago. And he talked about how information should be free, which was sort of a jab at Mark Zuckerberg not letting you you basically can't Google Facebook, and that's by design because Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg, say what you will about them, they understand the power of data. So I think that you can certainly benefit from it, but if you think that you're going to get all of your answers from any social network, much less Facebook, absolutely not. A question? Yeah, you 
in medical school. How would big data be right? How would big data be used in an academic setting? It's funny. Um, I think it was that book Super Crunchers, but it might have been no, no, no. It was um, the Half Life of Facts by I think it was Sam Abramson. It's a great book. And I think the line from medical school students was from the teachers, forget what, half of what you learn, because in 10 years it won't be true anymore. So to sort of answer your question, as we continue to unearth new discoveries and figure out things that you couldn't possibly have predicted, I think that we'll know more. And maybe there won't be a half-life of facts. Maybe there'll be a quarter-life of facts. It depends, I guess, on the adoption. Few people would argue, I think, that we're generating more data than ever and that that trend going back to the three Vs is intensifying. I don't know the answer to your question because going back to one of the first slides about doctors not listening to data and pilots do, I think it will hinge upon adoption. Unfortunately, based on my own personal experience working in pharma and in hospitals, there are definitely some tech-friendly doctors. There's a great um, uh, doctor I quote in the book by, Ke by the name of Kevin Foe, and he is the doctor that understands technology and social data. It's, I think it's kevinmd.com or at Twitter, at kevinmd. If the medical schools were filled with people like that, I think we would ex um, advance a lot quicker. But I've also met Plenty of doctors. I, I went to the podiatrist a couple weeks ago and started asking him about technology. And he basically was two years away from retirement and kind of poo-pooed it. said, eh, technology. So hopefully over time, um, at the risk of being politically incorrect, people who understand the benefits of technology, old or young, doesn't matter, will supplant those that don't want to be questioned. Right? And let's be honest, there are plenty of people who resent the fact, I remember this from pharma, Right? I went to medical school for, t for 10 years, incurred hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, and you saw a 30-second ad for a drug, and now you're going to tell me what to prescribe. I understand the tension. Any other questions? How are we doing on time, Ellen? Good. Anyone? Okay. Well, thank you all for your time. I will be signing books.